Hello everybody and welcome to another Rus Copernicus webinar. My name is Miguel Castro Gomez and today I will guide you through this exercise which in this occasion is going to be monitoring volcanic emissions with Sentinel-5P data. We will be working in an area of interest located in Guatemala, more in concrete in uh, Volcán del Fuego in the year 2018. Before starting, let me, give you, uh, let me tell you the objectives of this session. You will learn two main things. First, how to monitor SO2 with Sentinel-5P data. And second, what is the Rus Copernicus service and how it can help you in your projects with Copernicus data. Be aware that this webinar is going to be run using Python code. No prior knowledge is required, although um, it is always advisable. So just before starting, be aware that this webinar is being recorded and that you will be able to repeat the exercise by yourself. But don't worry about that now. I will give you more information later on on how to do it. The exercise is divided in uh, four sections. First of all, I will introduce you to the Rus Copernicus service, the project that is hosting this series of webinars. Then we will talk about the Sentinel-5P mission, its uh, products and characteristics. Then we will go into the exercise. I will start by uh, talking a little bit about the SO2 and how it interacts in the atmos atmosphere, why it's a problem. And uh, we will then go to the Rus Copernicus virtual machine to run the exercise. At the very end, we will dedicate some time for a Q&A session that should uh, last around 20-30 minutes. Overall, the complete duration of this webinar should be around 1 hour and 30 minutes. So let's get started and let's do so by introducing the Rus Copernicus service. Well, Rus stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products. It is an initiative founded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency with the objective to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support R&D activities. The service provides a free and open scalable platform in a powerful computing environment, hosting a suite of open source toolboxes that are pre-installed on virtual machines, which allow you to handle and process the data derived from the Sentinel satellites. So what does that mean? Well, the idea here is that with the large amount of data produced by the Sentinel satellites, the challenge is no longer data availability in Earth observation, but rather storage and processing capacity. To solve that, RUS offers virtual machines so that you have the appropriate computing environment to handle the data. In addition to all that, RUS also provides a specialized user help desk to support your remote sensing activities with Sentinel data and a dedicated training program. So some updates regarding the Rus Copernicus project. Since last September 2020, Rus Copernicus has designed a new offer in order to reach a greater number of users and provide them with Rus tools and services. As before, we organized the Rus offer around two main activities. First, the support to individual users and their R&D projects. And secondly, our well-known training activities, which include face-to-face -face events, webinars, and support to external trainings. So let me, let me comment the main changes in each category. Regarding face-to-face -face events, not much has changed. We maintain a small audience to ensure a high level of interaction. VMs will have, in this case, four to eight uh, cores, depending on the processing needs of the exercise, and will last one month maximum, period in which the ICT support will also be available. Regarding the webinars, we will maintain the rate of one webinar per month, and we will keep publishing the step-by-step -step guides as before. The update here is that there will be a limited amount of VMs for webinar repeat, and their duration will be two weeks maximum. Next, the support to external training organization and operation. We will maintain this activity, but there will be a limit in the number of VMs available, which will also have the ICT support. And finally, the last update regarding the support we provide to individual users. In this case, the VMs will no longer be available for this category. We will provide a Docker image to make the Ruse working environment available. This will include a suite of pre-installed open source tools for processing Copernicus data. Support will be available to help users setting the Docker containers in their local PCs. Finally, and for your information, Ruse VMs are provided from Copernicus DS and other cloud providers. So, you can find all the information about the project and how to register on our websites. I'm leaving you here in this slide the links to them. In the first one, rules-copernicus.eu, you can register for the service, you can manage your virtual machine, etc. On the uh, other one, rules-training.eu, you will find all the information regarding our training activities, 
registration for webinars, remote face-to-face -face events, etc. Uh, also, and as I said, this webinar is being recorded and uh, as with uh, previous ones, we upload all of them into our YouTube channel. So I highly uh, encourage you to check it. I'm sure you will find uh, more than one exercise that is relevant for your interest or for your work. And there's already a very long list of material available. Okay, so let's move on now and focus on the uh, satellite mission on Sentinel-5P. So Sentinel-5 Precursor, or Sentinel-5P, is the first Copernicus mission dedicated to monitoring our atmosphere. The satellite maps a multitude of air pollutants around the globe. Launched in October 2017, Sentinel-5P reached its uh, routine operation phase in early 2019. It aimed to fill the data gap and provide data continuity between the retirement of the Envisat satellite, the NASA's Aura mission, and the launch of the upcoming Sentinel-5. The satellite carries the state-of-the-art tropomy instrument to map a multitude of trace gases. Some details about the technical characteristics of the mission. In this occasion, we have a single satellite mission, not like Sentinel-1, 2 or 3, which are composed of two twin satellites, and it has a swath of 2600 kilometers. It has a daily revisit time and a spatial resolution of 7 by 3.5 kilometers. It follows a polar sun-synchronous orbit in loose formation with the Suomi NPP mission from NOAA. Loose formation here means that Sentinel-5P orbits 3.5 minutes behind Suomi NPP. And the reason for this is that Suomi pro provides a collocated high-resolution cloud mask, which is actually important for calculating methane. So let's now talk about the instrument carried by Sentinel-5P. It's called Tropomi, and what sets Tropomi apart is that it measures in the ultraviolet and visible, near-infrared and short-wave infrared spectral bands. This means that a wide range of pollutants such as nitrogen dioxide, ozone, formaldehyde, sulfur dioxide, methane, iron, and for example carbon monoxide can be imaged more accurately than ever before. So let's move now to the different data products produced by Sentinel-5P. Data products from Sentinel-5P Tropomis instrument are distributed to users at two different levels. The first one I want to highlight here in this slide is the level 1B. This uh, provides geolocated and radiometrically corrected top of the atmosphere Earth radiance in all spectral bands, as well as solar irradiance and is at the same time the main input for the other level, which is the level 2, that provides atmospheric geophysical parameters. This level 2 is the product type most of you as regular users would be interested on and is of course the one we'll be, we will be using in this uh, webinar. So in this list you can see the full, or in this slide sorry, you can see the full list of the level 2 products available and as you can see we have products for all the trace gases that I have already mentioned, so ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, um, etc. Finally, the last technical aspect I want to share with you about this mission is the timeliness of the data. In this regard, we can distinguish three options. Products can be delivered as an NRT or near real time, and this category is mainly to be in line with the needs of numerical forecasting systems. It only applies to level two products, which are to be supplied within three hours after sensing. Another category is uh, offline, so in this case, uh, it's also known as non-time critical and takes advantage of increased accuracies achievable when specific calibration steps and uh, trace gas retrievals are performed with more time. And finally, there is a third category in terms of timeliness, which is uh, reprocessing. This one has no time constraint and it happens whenever it's necessary, for example, due to the upgrade of an algorithm uh, for the retrieval of the trace gases, etc. Okay, so as you can see uh, from the list of products available, we are going to be using the le level two SO2 product. Um, let me give you some insights regarding this uh, level two products. Well, first of all, you need to know that Sentinel 5P products are delivered as NetCDF files. And it's important to understand at least the basics of this format. NetCDF, or Network Common Data Form, is, the, is a file format for storing multidimensional scientific data, such as temperature, humidity, pressure, etc. 
each of these uh, data, each of these variables can be displayed through a dimension such as time. This format is widely used in the atmospheric and oceanographic communities. And some of the main characteristics are that are self-describing, meaning that a NetCDF file includes information about the data it contains, uh, but at the same time, data about when they were captured or where they were captured and what units were are being used, etc. Another characteristic is that NetCDF files are portable or cross-platform, meaning that uh, a NetCDF file created on one type of operating system can be read by software on another type of operating system. And at the same time, NetCDF files are scalable, meaning that a small subset of a large NetCDF file can be accessed efficiently without reading the entire file. Knowing that is very uh, important to properly exploit Sentinel 5P data uh, and uh, to understand how NetCDF files organize information. In this format, you can find uh, different, um, let's say, uh, concepts. The first one is dimensions. A NetCDF dimension has both a name and, and the size and can be used to represent a real physical dimension. For example, the dimension of time or in space, the latitude and longitude uh, or the height. Then we have the variables. In, um, in variables, so it, it's in the variables of a NetCDF file that you will find the actual measurement. A variable represents an array of values of the same type and are used to store, to store the bulk of the data in a NetCDF file. A variable, of course, has a name, has a data type, has a shape, um, and at the same time has a list of the dimensions specified when the variable is created. Then we have the concept of attributes. NetCDF attributes are used to store metadata or ancillary data. Most attributes will provide you information about the specific variable, but on the other hand, you can also find attributes that provide information about the complete NetCDF file, and those are called global attributes. And finally, we have the coordinate variables. A one-dimension variable with the same name as a dimension is called a coordinate variable. It is associated with a dimension of one or more data variables and typically defines a physical coordinate corresponding to that dimension. So this is just an overview of the data format. I really recommend you to go more deeply into it so that you can have a better understanding that will help you in the processing of Sentinel-5P data. So as I was saying today, we will be processing level 2 SO2 NetCDF files. When working with this data, you will see that different groups are used to organize the data and make it easier to find what you're looking for. The outermost layer in these NetCDF files is the file itself. Then two groups can be seen, the product and the metadata. Both of them contain at the same time subgroups. Very briefly, what will you find in product and metadata groups? Well, in the products uh, group, the variables in this group will answer to the questions of what, when, where, and how well. This group stores the main data fields of the product, including the position of the main parameters, latitude, longitude, and variable to determine the observation time and the dimension needed for the data. In addition, you will find uh, all the variables like the QA value parameter. I, uh, we will come back to this concept during the exercise, but just to let you know, this is very important here since this QA value summarizes the processing flag into a continuous value, giving a quality percentage for every pixel. So a value of one is a pixel that has a full quality, let's say, and a, um, a value of zero for a pixel means that there is um, a failure in the processing. The other group is metadata, and basically here you will find metadata that is required by metadata standards. In general, I would recommend you to check always the documentation of the products and missions you are working with, but special attention here to the product user manual that is available in this case for this sulfur dioxide product level 2 from, from Sentinel-5P. I'm leaving you here with the front page and with the link. If you are working with this data, I really recommend you to check this file. It contains a very detailed explanation of the format file of the different groups and what you can find where. So it's really a must if you are thinking about working with Sentinel-5P data. Okay, so we have now 
a clear idea of the Sentinel-5 permission and its products and characteristics, let's now uh, start with the exercise. So during this webinar, you will be introduced to Sentinel-5 P data, especially level two products. We will discuss, as you know, this, we have discussed the structure of the NetCDF files in which the data is distributed, and uh, we will explore them using a well-known Python library known as XArray. In addition, you will learn how to exploit this level two SO2 data to assess the increase of SO2 concentration caused by the eruption of Volcán de Fuego in Guatemala in June 2018. You will learn how to access the root service and how to download, process, analyze, and visualize the free data acquired by the Copernicus satellites. To do all of this, we will work on a Rus Copernicus virtual machine, where we will find the appropriate storage and processing capacity to run this uh, job. In there, we will use a Jupyter notebook to run the Python code. Among all the modules we will use, the one I want to highlight here at this point is XArray. Since this is the Python package on which we will base the exploitation of the NetCDF files. Overall, all of this will be based from a technical point of view on an Anaconda distribution of Python. For those of you that are new to these concepts, let me explain them very briefly. Anaconda is a free and open source distribution of the Python and R programming languages for scientific computing and aims to simplify package management and deployment. On the other hand, the Jupyter Notebook is an open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live code, equations, visualizations, and narrative text. If you're new to Jupyter Notebook, don't worry, I will, uh, we are going to use it in this exercise, and of course I will go again uh, through it and you will, you will see it very clearly. Okay, so now that we are talking about tools, uh, and since I'm assuming most of you might be new to Sentinel-5P data since it's kind of a recent uh, mission. Maybe you are not very aware of all the options, all the tools that are available to process this, this type of data. So I just want to give you very briefly some background information on all the possibilities you have to process Sentinel-5P data. So if we think about GUI tools, you have the option of using the ESA Atmospheric Toolbox, which includes, uh, amongst other, the uh, HARP software a toolkit for ingesting, processing, and uh, comparing satellite or model data against cor correlative data. I will not go into more details about HARP and the atmospheric toolbox since there are already other Rus Copernicus webinars that make use of it. Another popular option is the use of Panoply. Uh, I'm leaving again here you the description and links in case you're interested. Then if we consider a programming approach, you can find several options in Python. For example, the XArray library that we are going to use today. Of course, the NetCDF4 module as well, and other options are, for example, the IDIS uh, module. If you prefer to work in R, there are also alternatives. You can find, for example, the R NetCDF uh, package or the raster package, which is very common, or as well the NCDF or NDCF4 uh, packages in R. So overall, as you can see, plenty of options to analyze this uh, type of, of products, this type of data format. Okay, so before starting now with the final exercise, let me give you some background information on the pollutant we will be mapping today. So sulfur dioxide or SO2 is a colorless, bad smelling toxic gas that is part of a larger group of chemicals referred to as sulfur oxides or SOx. Sulfur dioxide enters the Earth's atmosphere via both natural and anthropogenic processes. Through the formation of sulfate aerosols and sulfuric acid, it plays an important role on the chemistry at local and global scales, and its impacts range from the short-term pollution to climate forcing. Consequently, global observation of SO2 are important for atmospheric and climate research. Well, I mean, while about one third of the global surface emissions originate from natural sources like volcanoes and biogenic uh, activity, the main contributor to the total budget is from anthropogenic emissions, mainly from the combustion of fossil fuels by power plants and other industrial facilities, metal processing like extracting metal from ore, uh, smelting facilities, and of course, we cannot forget about vehicles, especially. Uh, those that use diesel. Sulfur dioxide and associated oxides 
and secondary pollutants can contribute, uh, if we think about its, their impact in, in, in the health of, of humans, they can contribute to respiratory illness by making breathing more difficult, especially for children, the elderly, and those with pre-existing conditions. Longer exposures can aggravate existing heart and lung conditions. Sulfur dioxide and other oxides are partially responsible in the formation of thick haze and smoke, which can impair visibility in addition to impacting health. Beyond human health impacts, sulfur dioxide contributions to acid rain can cause direct harm to trees and plants by damaging exposed tissue and subsequently decreasing plant growth. Other sensitive ecosystems and waterways are also impacted by acid, uh, acid rain. SO2 is removed from the atmosphere by dry and wet deposition or by chemical conversion to sulfuric acid. The respective SO2 lifetime in the troposphere is about two weeks. However, heterogeneous reactions on cloud droplets convert SO2 into sulfuric acid on much shorter timescales of days or even hours. Empirically, I mean, empirically derived SO2 depletion rates uh, differ then from se by several orders of magnitudes depending on whether homogeneous or heterogeneous reactions are predominant in the atmosphere. In the stratosphere, the lifetime of sulfur dioxide molecules is of several weeks. The lifetime of particles can at the same time vary with particle size. Accumulation mode particles such as sulfates are kept in suspension by normal air motions and have a lower deposition velocity than coarse mode particles. They can be transported thousands of kilometers and remain in the atmosphere for a number of days. They are removed from the atmosphere primarily by cloud processes. Particulates affect acid deposition by serving as cloud condensation nuclei and contribute directly to the acidification of rain. In addition, the gas phase species that uh, lead to the dry deposition of acidity are also precursor of particles. Therefore, reduction in SO2 emissions will decrease both acid deposition and particulate matter concentrations, but not necessarily in a linear fashion. Sulfuric acid is also, de is also deposited on surfaces by dry deposition and can contribute to environmental effects. Overall, Satellite measurements of SO2 provide valuable information on volcanic emissions and have been used to investigate volcano activity since the late 70s. Strong explosive volcanic eruptions can generally be well observed from space, particularly if the SO2 plume reaches the upper troposphere or even the stratosphere, where the satellite's sensitivity is high and the plume is not shielded by clouds. At the same time, you have to know that uh, while ultraviolet measurements are highly sensitive to SO2 at high altitudes, like in the upper troposphere or in the lower stratosphere, the sensitivity to SO2 concentration in the boundary layer is intrinsically limited from space due to the combined effect of scattering on molecules, uh, aerosols and, and cloud particles, and at the same time by ozone absorption that hampers the penetration of solar radiation into the lowest atmosphere la layers. Furthermore, you have to know that SO2 absorption signature suffers from interference with the ozone absorption spectrum. Okay, so with this introduction being made, we are ready now to start our exercise. And I'm leaving you here with uh, the outline of what we are going to do now. So first of all, I will uh, do a demo and show you how you can actually download Sentinel-5 P data, where to go and how to do it. Uh, then we will have a quick introduction to um, the way I'm going, uh, I'm going to launch my Jupyter Notebook. This is a little bit more technical, so I will launch an Anaconda environment and I will show you how to do it for those of you that are new to this. Uh, and then we will start the exercise in this Jupyter Notebook. And the overall idea here is to explore the NetCDF groups that I've talked about before, since uh, this is the way the, the, the Sentinel-5P products are structured. We will see how to navigate through groups and how to access a specific variable. Remember, a variable in NetCDF is where the actual measurement is located. Then we will apply the quality filter. I will show you how to do it and uh, what it means and what's the impact of that. And finally, we'll finish the exercise by doing a geographical uh, subset to our region of interest. And finally, we will visualize the final concentration of SO2 that happened due to the eruption of uh, Volcán de Fuego in Guatemala 
in June 2018. Okay, so let me go now to my virtual machine and we start the exercise. Okay, so here I am in the welcome page of the Rus Copernicus virtual machine. As you can see, I'm using a web browser to access it and I'm just going to put the full screen here to have better visibility. So when you access the virtual machine uh, from Bruce Copernicus, you will have some credentials that we have sent you once you have registered. And uh, let's just log in here. So as you can see, uh, this is how a virtual machine looks like. Uh, if you are new to this kind of uh, way of working into cloud computing, uh, let me give you a very brief introduction to it. What you can expect here is basically the same way to interact as you would do with your regular computer. The only difference here is that we are accessing the resources in terms of processing and storage capacity via an internet browser. Once you are in the virtual machine, you will find everything you would expect on a regular computer. So, for example, we have the predefined list of software that, in the case of the Rus Copernicus virtual machines, comes already installed by default. So, you can find, for example, Snap, uh, QGIS, uh, and RStudio, etc., and many other softwares. Remember, you can see the full list in the Rus Copernicus website. At the same time, we have a file manager system just to store your data and, uh, and your files. And of course, we have a dedicated internet browser in the, uh, in the virtual machine. In this case, we are using Firefox. Remember, everything you do within the virtual machine relies on the resources, on the IT infrastructure that is supporting the VM. So everything you store will be stored not in your local computer, but in the virtual machine. In the same way, the access to the internet that we are doing through the virtual machine relies on the connection to the internet from the servers. Your local connection to the internet is required, but only to connect to the virtual machine. Okay, so let's start this exercise. And for this, I'm going to show you how to download Sentinel 5P data. Well, what you have to do is first of all, go and open an internet browser, in this case Firefox, and navigate to shyhub.copernicus.eu. This is the uh, web portal uh, where you will find the official access to Copernicus data. Since today we are interested on Sentinel-5P, we are going to click on, on this tab here. If you would be interested in Sentinel-1, 2, and 3 data, you would go to the Open Hub. And also for your information, remember that the ShyHub offers an API access point in case you want to automatize the data access and download. So let's go into the Sentinel-5 pre-operations uh, hub. And once you are here, I would, uh, of course, recommend you to log in. Uh, this is something required. Uh, we can use the, uh, the guest account so far. So let's just put this here. And we are in the system. Okay, so once you are logged in, remember this is completely free and it's something you can do if you want to use your own account very quickly. We need to look for our images. So in today's exercise, we are interested to, in, in Volcán del Fuego, which is located in Guatemala, so in uh, Central America. So if we uh, zoom in over here, uh, we can find it. So this is more or less to the south of the capital of Guatemala, which is Guatemala City, uh, and more or less here. Remember, Sentinel-5P orbits are not very are, are quite large. They are they have a swath of uh, 2,600 kilometers. So no need to specify your study area in a very precise manner, unless it is really on the boundary of two orbits. So to define your region of interest, what we are going to do is change here to the drawing mode, and I'm going to draw a polygon more or less here. Okay, once this is done, we are going to set some parameters to specify which product from Sentinel-5P we are interested on. So for this, I'm going to open the Advanced Parameter tab. And the first thing is to set the sensing period. For today's exercise, we are interested on, on an event that happened on June 2018, in particular, the 3rd of June. Uh, so just to show you different products, I'm gonna put not only the third, but I'm gonna put from the second, to the 4th of June of 2018. Okay, uh, in, the, in that way we will see products from different dates. I want to show you a little bit the footprints, how they change. Once you have set your sensing period, we well, need to activate the mission. Since we are in the Sentinel-5P pre-operations data hub, you see there is only the mission for, the only possibility for mission is Sentinel-5P. I'm saying that because if you are used to Sentinel-1, 2, and 3, 
you know that this menu here is a little bit longer since it includes the search parameters for all the missions, but it's not the case in, in here. So we select uh, Sentinel 5P and now we're going to go and set some advanced parameters. First of all, the product type. So if you remember from my presentation, Sentinel 5P has uh, level 1 and level 2 products. You can see here the level 1, they start with this L1B and the level 2 starts with L2. For this exercise, we are interested in the uh, sulfur dioxide. So this is the last one here, we are going to select it. The rest of the parameters is something you can, uh, it's not mandatory to do a search, uh, although they can help you to refine, to refine it. For example, the processing level. Well, we know already we are going to look for a level two product, so this is kind of redundant. You could put it or leave it empty. Uh, it's going to work both ways. Uh, for the timeliness, if you are, for example, looking for near real-time products, uh, that would work. If you're looking for offline products, you would go this way or reprocessing. Remember, near real-time products are only available uh, for level two products and within three hours of sensing, but they do not contain the full orbit. Um, so, okay, that's something you need to know. Again, if uh, if um, you are not specifically looking for near re for near real time products or for uh, reprocessing products, you can just leave it empty, empty, and you will see the result. And finally, you can also search products by inserting their absolute orbit number in case you are aware of which is the uh, orbit you are looking for. In our case, we're gonna leave it like that. It's gonna work uh, in any ways. So the important thing is the sensing time, the uh, check on the mission, and the definition of the product you're interested. Once you have all of this, we click on the search icon here, and we just wait. And in a few seconds, we get back the, the answer. So we can see on the map here, the footprint of the products. And um, as you can see, we have three. Remember Sentinel 5P has a daily revisit time since we have put products from the 2nd to the, uh, to the 4th of June of 2018. Well, we have these three products and you can see how they uh, shift a little bit uh, due to the uh, slightly movement of uh, in, in the orbits. For this exercise, we are interested on the product of the 3rd of June because this is when the eruption happened. However, in the training kit of this exercise, I'm going to ask you as well to download the products from one day before and one day after the eruption so that you can repeat afterwards the analysis I'm going to show you today and you can see the evolution of, of SO2 uh, and its concentration on the air. Okay, so we can see here the footprint and if you're coming from other sentinels, well, this for sure looks completely different. In this case, remember, we are downloading the full orbit and not a subset of it, like for example, in Sentinel-2 or Sentinel-1. So that's why we have this shape. It starts, uh, well, goes totally from the North Pole to the um, South Pole following this polar sun synchronous orbit. As with uh, all the Sentinel missions, we can have a look uh, before downloading the product to some metadata. Uh, so for example, well, definitely there is no, uh, a quick look that can help you here a lot, but in any case, you can find uh, well, the size of the product and many other, the footprint and many other information that might be relevant uh, to you. Uh, if you go down, also the footprint is quite large here. Well, you can see, for example, the orbit number, uh, which you could use, for example, to, uh, to do a search, uh, the sensing time with exact timing, uh, etc. Okay, so once you have identified a product of interest, what, what you have to do is basically download the product. And for this, you can click on this arrow here, and this will start a regular download process in the virtual machine. Remember, this file is going into the storage capacity, into the uh, storage folders of the VM. Okay, so this is briefly how, I mean, this is in detail how you download Sentinel 5P data. Let me now, before starting, show you uh, the structure of this specific training kit. So, of course, I have downloaded the, the products in advance, so I'm just going to skip the, the one we have used today. And in this virtual machine, uh, or in, for this exercise, I have structured the folders in this particular way. I want you to be aware of this because in our Python exercise, I'm going to be making reference to this path. So I, I want to make sure we are all aware of uh, what's behind. So in this specific path, I have three subfolders, uh, Auxdata, Original, and Processing. So pretty self-describing. In original, I have the three products I was mentioning before. I have already uh, downloaded, I have already 
um, download the, the products for, for this exercise. Uh, in the AUX data, I have basically the Python, well, the Jupyter notebook containing the Python code for the analysis, some auxiliary data, and also uh, this file here pointing to the Conda environment in case you want to uh, install it by yourself. And in processing, it's just an empty folder where uh, I'm leaving you this folder here for you to save outputs in case you, you find this uh, relevant. Okay, so how to start this uh, Jupyter notebook and how to do it the proper way. Well, remember in this case, we are using a Conda, we are using an Anaconda distribution of Python, meaning we are, I have created in advance a specific Conda environment in which I have installed all the dependencies of this exercise. So if you are new to Anaconda, how do you activate an environment? Well, in Linux, what you have to do is open the terminal and just write Conda activate and then followed by the uh, name of the environment. In this case, I, I have called the environment of this training kit admo3, uh, which is making reference to the training code of this exercise, which is admo03. And um, again, this environment already contains all the Python modules that are needed. If you want to create this Python environment in your, in your virtual machine, if it's not present, you can go to the um, AUX data folder of the, in the directory of this exercise and use the, uh, this file and follow regular Anaconda instructions to create an environment from this file. This is common and very um, usual procedure when working with Anaconda. Okay, once I have the environment activated, I can see the confirmation because in parentheses here, I have moved from the base environment to this one. So this is the confirmation. And now I can just uh, launch Jupyter Loanbook. In this case, I'm using Jupyter Lab, which is the, the newest version, let's say. Okay, so once you are in, uh, in Jupyter Lab, this is the interface you're gonna see. And what you have to do is basically either create a new notebook or open one that already exists. In the uh, left panel, we can open a file browser in Jupyter Lab, navigate in this case to the folder where we have the file, remember this path. And in here, I'm gonna open the file code underscore Atmo03, okay? So this is the uh, notebook. And again, for visualization, I'm gonna go full screen here on my um, on uh, on this browser to have better visibility. Okay, so here is where the exercise starts. Um, so I have well, you have here basically some extra information I have already mentioned during my presentation. So I will not go uh, again into this. Just if you're repeating this exercise, have a look. If you're new to Python, uh, check the links I'm leaving you here. If you want to know more about Sentinel-5P, apart from what I have already explained in this webinar, you can check the technical documentation in this link that I'm leaving you here. And again, and just to insist, this uh, exercise is gonna use Python code. I'm gonna run it with you, I'm gonna explain it. And of course, if you have some prior knowledge in Python, uh, this is always helpful. However, I'm not expecting you to, to know. Uh, you're, you're here to learn that process. So that's uh, totally fine. And because of that, I'm leaving you here some tutorials for Python and for Jupyter in case this is completely new to you. So in my introduction, I was mentioning that Jupyter Notebooks are is a web application. So you've seen it launches in the web browser of the virtual machine that allows you to combine code with narrative text, links and images. So as you can see in this document, I have, for example, this image, I have uh, several links here have this text that helps me to uh, introduce the exercise and the analysis I'm going to do. And uh, all of this is within uh, something called in Jupyter a markdown cell. A markdown cell is basically a cell in which you put these narrative uh, elements that are going to help you to describe the code. There is another type of cell in Jupyter that is known as a code cell. And it's in these code cells where you write the actual Python code in this case, since we are using a Python kernel here. So as you can see, you can distinguish them very easily. Uh, code cells are have this kind of gray background while markdown cells are, are completely white. And of course, these cells are the one that you can execute to run the analysis. So there are different ways to, to run uh, code cells in Jupyter Notebook. I would say the, uh, uh, 
a, a very common shortcut is to press Ctrl Enter or Shift Enter with your keyboard at the same time. However, you can also go in JupyterLab and press the play button once you are within this code cell. And you can also definitely go to the run menu and select any of those options that, are, that is available. Okay, so making this introduction, uh, and again, I'm leaving you here with this text. Uh, let's start the, the analysis. So how are we going to divide this exercise? Well, the first thing we will do is to load all the Python modules that are required for this analysis. Then we will uh, load and explore the Sentinel 5P product from the 3rd of June 2018. We will uh, access the groups uh, of the NetCDF file. We will see how to check for the variables, etc. Once this is clear, I will introduce you to the, um, to, to the QA value or filtering pixels for their quality. And uh, once this is done, I will uh, show you how with uh, XArray we can very quickly subset a NetCDF file. And for this, we will be using an interactive way of subsetting. Usually you would, for example, in regular procedures, what you would do is upload some kind of vector data that represents your region of interest, and then use that vector data to mask or to subset your raster file. Well, in this exercise, I want to show you a different way which takes advantage of the capabilities of Jupyter Notebook and the nice interactions that you can have with it. Once we have done the subset, we will visualize the SO2 subset product and we will see actually the emissions from the, uh, the SO2 emissions coming from the eruption of the volcano. Okay, so let's start. And the first thing is load these Python modules. So very briefly for those of you that um, don't know those Python modules, I just want to give you a quick overview of what they do. So the first one I have here is IPyLeaflet. This is a Python module uh, that is very common for interactive maps. We will then use matplotlib for, to create uh, visualizations and graphs. Uh, term color is just gonna be a function that will help us to print uh, some, st some strings in Python with, with color. Cartopy together with mat matplotlib will help us to create graphs and visualizations. XArray and NetCDF are the main drivers for the NetCDF file handling and analysis. So these two libraries are doing the actual work with the NetCDF files. Um, we have NumPy, which is a very, very well-known library in Python for, let's say, array manipulation. Well, and again, here I'm just importing the, those two models again uh, completely. Uh, Glob, uh, finally, it's going to be a module that will help us navigate through the different folders in the VM from, from the Python code. Okay, so as you can see, and if you're new to Python, um, well, apart from, you can see I'm importing in different ways. So sometimes I'm importing the full uh, module, the, the full package. Sometimes I'm importing a specific module with this terminology. But something that, that you can see is that at the same time, I'm defining this as uh, parameter. If you are uh, if this is new to you, just to let you know that this is just creating an acronym so that each time I have to call, for example, Xarray, I don't have to write the full name, but just this very short uh, string, which is going to make my, my code cleaner and, and, and simpler. Okay, so we have the, the modules. Now let's run this cell. And again, you can use the key combination, Control enter uh, So I'm going to do that. And since we are running this Jupyter Notebook in the right Conda environment that contains all these modules already installed, you can see I didn't get any error. What I get is a confirmation that the cell has been executed properly. And that confirmation comes from the fact that I don't see any error, right? At the same time, we can see there is here a little index, and this is representing the order in which the code cells have been run. So. Uh, if you see, this code cell has an empty um, uh, square bracket here, meaning that it has not been run yet. This one has number one because it has been run and it was in the first position, let's say. If I run it again, you will see it becomes now two because I have run it for in the second uh, position, let's say. Okay, so I have everything ready. Let's uh, move on. The next thing is going to be to load and explore the Sentinel-5P products. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, what we are doing is uh, to set a Python variable that is pointing to the um, folder where I have my products. So you remember the folder I was showing before? Well, here I'm basically uh, declaring 
its uh, location within the virtual machine file system. When this is done, what we are going to do is to create a list, a sorted list, so order. Uh, and in that list, I want to see the full path to my SO2 products. So what I'm saying here to, to Python is, okay, go to this folder or go to this, um, yeah, go to this folder and look for any file that in its name has SO2 and ends with .nc. .nc is the acronym for netcdf file. And once you have this, create a list out of this and store it in this variable called sendinf5p underscore files. Once uh, this has happened, what I'm going to do is just print the content of this list. The only difference is that I'm printing it in a, let's say, different way. Instead of just printing it uh, straight away, I'm using the method split to show you the information of the file name in a different way. I will go back into this uh, once we execute this code cell. Once we have this uh, list created that is pointing to the files, what I'm going to do is open those files. And for this, I'm using the XArray library. You can see here I'm using XR to point to that um, package. And then I'm using the function open dataset. Open dataset is the function in XArray that opens, that ingests those files into the Python memory and then uh, enables you or gives you the possibility to continue your analysis. So as you can see, what I'm saying is open dataset and then go to the variable s5p underscore files, square brackets one. This square brackets one uh, means that this is a list and that I'm taking the uh, file that is in position one. Remember Python starts with index zero. Why do I have a one here? Well, if you remember well, in the folder I showed you, we have three different Sentinel-5P products. One from the 2nd of June, one from the 3rd of June, which is the day of the eruption, and one from the 4th. Since Python starts with its indexing with position zero, the first file of the 2nd of June is in position zero. The uh, second file, which is the, uh, the day of the eruption, is in position one, and so on. Okay, so, I'm going to open this, and once it's opened in memory, I'm going to show it to you with this display function. Okay, so once um, this is done, uh, I'm going to do the same, and in this case, I'm going to open the same product, but in this case, I'm going to specify the parameter group. If you remember from the presentation, we were mentioning that um, NetCDF files are arranged in, for Sentinel 5P are arranged in different groups, and each group contains uh, well different variables, coordinates, dimension, etc. All of this is explained in the technical documentation. So in XArray, once you want to access one of those groups, you have to specify its location with the group parameter. And in this case, I'm going to go into the group metadata and then the subgroup granular description. And then I'm just again. I'm going to save this in this variable and I'm going to display it here. And finally, I will do the same, but in this case, I will access the product group, which is the one that actually contains all the measurements uh, we are looking for. Okay, so let's run this cell and let's have a look. So what we get, uh, first of all, is this very big print uh, statement. Uh, and this is telling us which are the products that have been found in the folder that we have specified. So it's giving us here the, the product name that has been found uh, in position zero, then in position one and in position two. Uh, for convenience and for you to better understand uh, what it means, this very long name, I have split the, the product name in different subsections. If you're not aware, Copernicus products and all Sentinel products in general from all the missions follow what is known as a naming convention, meaning that the product name already gives you a lot of information about um, um, when the product was acquired, which product type is, from which mission, etc. Of course, this is something very helpful when you start to work with a lot of products and you want to automatize uh, processing chains. So in this case, the, the product name, for example, starts with the mission, Sentinel 5P, with a stream level, in this case, um, uh, it's a level two for, for the level, 
uh, will have product and the identifier is an SO2 product. The sensing time, it starts and ends. Uh, the, the orbit, uh, collection, etc. So again, all very relevant information, mainly when you are working with a massive amount of data and you want somehow to, uh, you want your, your Python scripts or your, your processing chains to uh, navigate through the files properly. So using the product name can be something very helpful. Okay, so remember, out of those th uh, three products, I'm going to focus on only on this one. I'm leaving you the others for you to try by yourself and explore how uh, the SO2 concentration changed from the day before and the day after the eruption. But so far, let's focus on this one. And uh, after printing all of this, we have opened this file and we have done all of this about the groups, etc. So the first thing uh, I'm showing you, uh, here are the global attributes. Remember, uh, attributes are the metadata of an etcdf file and usually they refer to a specific variable however attributes can also uh, be written to address specific metadata of the complete product and this is exactly what is happening here one of the nice things of uh, jupyter notebook in this case is that we can visualize the product in a very interactive way so remember netcdf, ha NetCDF file files have always a dimension coordinates variables and attributes in this case, since we have opened the product at the, with, without entering any group, we are, let's say, on the first layer of the NetCDF file, and here we can only find attributes. And if I expand this arrow here, you can see the list of those attributes. So all of these are just metadata referring to the product by itself. Uh, for example, the, uh, the minimum lat or, well, information about uh, the, the project, the uh, creator name, I mean, um, the spatial resolution, well, you can definitely navigate through here and find, again, very useful information. Uh, sometimes extracting metadata from the data uh, is required uh, to allow processing chains to continue from one way to another. And uh, you have to know that Sentinel-5P, they carry a lot of metadata and this can be very helpful. And you can access it very simply just like that. Uh, and of course, you can visualize it in this case in Jupyter Notebook also in a very graphical way, let's say. Okay, so this is the global attributes. Then uh, what we did was to access the metadata group and then inside the granule description uh, subgroup. In this case, we have again only attributes. Remember, the metadata uh, group is about um, metadata, so attributes. And again, here, for example, we can find all the type of metadata, in this case, the processing node, processing version that was used, um, etc. Again, a description of all of this, if there is a, a, um, an attribute that you don't understand the meaning or something like that, uh, all of this is referred in the technical documentation uh, and it's very easy to find. You will, uh, you will find answers there uh, very easily. Okay, and uh, finally we reached the product group. In this case, we are accessing the actual measurements and as you can see, we have coordinates and we have variables. Out of this, uh, well, at the same time, we also have um, uh, the dimensions that you can see here. Well, out of here, I want to highlight, because now the question can be, okay, but where can I find the actual measurement, the actual SO2 measurement, right? That's, of, of course, the question you're looking for uh, because it's there where the information is. Well, remember in NetCDF files, it's the variables that store the measurement. And in this case, we can find uh, the, sulfur uh, the sulfur dioxide total vertical column and its position. And you can, let's say, click here and uh, see a little bit more of information about, uh, about this specific variable. For example, the, the units, the standard name, long name, multiplications fac multiplication factor to convert to other units, uh, etc. So, and again, again, uh, here you can just visualize a little bit the data type, etc. So, what I want to highlight here to move on now is how easy it is in um, in Jupyter Notebook in particular to open an etcdf file, explore it, play with it a little bit, visualize the different attributes, variables, etc. Even before starting to do anything on the data. So far, here we are just uh, seeing the result of ingesting the product into the memory of Python. Okay, so 
Once we have the product ingested, and it is now, uh, remember it has been saved on this specific variable, S5P underscore IMG underscore uh, MT for the legal description, and very important, underscore PRD for the product. So in the next step, what we are going to do is to access the specific variable that contains the measurement. If you remember, uh, we saw it here, this uh, sulfur dioxide total vertical column. So to access this variable, how do you do it in Python with XArray? Well, first of all, you uh, write the name of the variable that contains the product, and then in square brackets, we write the name of that variable. So you can basically copy paste from here the, the name and put it here. This is going to be stored now in a new Python variable called SO2. And what I'm going to do at the same time is convert these measurements from uh, moles per square meter to Dobson units. If you are new to atmospheric uh, science or this kind of studies, uh, Dobson units, it's a measurement, a, a unit that is used very commonly in this domain. <clears throat> and again, I'm leaving you here with a, a quick explanation and a link if you want to expand your knowledge on it. So to convert from the original units that the product comes uh, with to, in this case, uh, Dobson units, it's very easy. We first of all take the SO2 variable before that is pointing to the measurement, and then we multiply it with the multiplication factor. And you specify the multiplication factor with the dot. In this case, not with uh, square brackets. This is for variables. In this case, we are reaching this attribute. And um, all of this, I'm going to save it uh, in the same variable SO2, which I'm going to rewrite. So let's run this. And as you can see, this is very fast. It has already happened. So far, we are not uh, seeing anything. We have done the, the work. And of course, now comes the question of, okay, let's visualize uh, this. this. Let's visualize this sulfur dioxide, finally. For this, I'm going to be using the uh, Cartopy um, package in Python. Um, don't want to go too much into the details of uh, how to get visualizations with Cartopy because definitely the way you visualize your data is completely up to you and there's no right or wrong way. So just to give you the reference, I'm using Cartopy. The main uh, thing here to look for is this line. This P color mesh is the one that is going to plot and the rest is just setting the title of the plot and some extra features to, to have a very vis visualization. So let's run this. Okay, and uh, now we have the first plot of our product. You can see here the title, Sentinel-5P, level 2 SO2, the date, and I'm also making reference to the fact that we didn't filter the data yet with a QA value. Okay, so we can see the, the product, um, the, so the full orbit. As you can see, I'm using this uh, projection, which I think represents the data better. I am centering the plot at those coordinates, um, minus 90 for the longitude and plus 15 for the, uh, so minus 90 west, let's say, and 15 north. Of course, this is something you can play with and change, and it's gonna, let's say, rotate this glow that we can see here. So we see the, the visualization of the measurements. We see the scale here with the units in, Dob in Dobson units, remember? And well, if uh, you, if you pay a little bit of attention to the plot, we can see that most of the measurement is close to zero, right? I mean, there we have uh, some extreme values around here, um, but most of the, let's say, of the, of the color we can see is this kind of yellowish. Well, if you pay um, closer attention, you will see that, uh, of course, we are looking at a volcano eruption, and you know Guatemala is somewhere over here, and it, if you look carefully, there is a little bit, a little hotspot, something reddish around there. Definitely, this is our emission, and this is what we are looking for. So now the question is, okay, let's have a closer look into there. We need to to zoom in. We need to subset this product and and zoom in to to see what's happening. Okay, we will do so. But first of all, we need to filter for those pixels that are actually not that don't have a good quality. What do I mean by quality? Well, pixels can be affected by several conditions, things like the presence of clouds, bad measurements, processing failures, etc. 
So whenever working with uh, Sentinel 5P products, you have to take this into account. Again, this is, uh, I know I'm insisting on this, but this is described very well in the technical documentation. In there, you will see which are the sources of error for pixels and how you have to take this QA value that I'm going to talk now uh, into consideration. So with the Sentinel 5P level two product comes a, um, a QA value uh, variable, let's say. This QA value variable is a continuous flag. Uh, you can see it here, a continuous quality descriptor that goes from zero to one, uh, meaning zero for no data and one for full quality data. So we can see this is uh, present in the product group. And uh, for every pixel, there is an associated QA value. And we need to know which are those pixels that have a value that is at least larger than 0 0.5. So if a pixel has a quality of less than 0 0.5, then we are going to consider that this pixel is uh, not good enough and cannot be taken into consideration for an analysis. So how to do this filter? How, how do we write this in, in Python and with this XArray uh, library? Well, what I'm going to do is call again this SO2 variable, which is uh, hosting my SO2 measurement. And I'm going to use the function where of the XArray um, package. And in here, I'm going to say, OK, go to the SO2 uh, product. So go to the SO2 measurement. And uh, at the same time, check if the QA value, which is stored in, uh, in here, so PRD, so this is the variable for the Sentinel 5P level two product that we have ingested. And in square brackets, we access the variable QA value. And we say, wherever this is larger than 0 0.5, then remove that pixel from, from my data and just do that for all of them. Okay, I'm going to save this output into the SO2 filter variable. And once we have this, we are going to uh, plot it just like we have done before. In this case, I'm going to plot on the left side the uh, QA value and on the right side the final result. So let's run this and have a look. OK, so once we have our final plot, uh, let's have a look to it. So on the left side, we can see this quality flag that uh, gives us values from 0 to 1. As you can see, it covers the same area as the measurement variable. So for every pixel, you can see there is a specific value. And you can see, for example, over North America, we have a very good quality, um, well, uh, etc. Uh, while we reach the South Pole, it starts to go to zero, uh, etc. On the right side, you can see the fil you can see the filtering we have done. So uh, for any pixel that has an associated value in the QA uh, variable that is larger than 0 0.5, then that pixel has been kept and the others are completely masked out. So you can see how these two patterns, uh, how these two plots, they, they match, let's say. And um, in this way, you can see how easy it is to remove those bad quality uh, pixels. So this is something definitely you have to take into account when processing Sentinel 5P data. It is, um, uh, it is something you have to do. And the QA value, the, the let's say the threshold that you use is also something that will define the, the quality of your assumptions. Again, all uh, the uh, more detailed explanation is found in the technical documentation. Okay, so let's now focus on this subset that we want to do to zoom in into our study area. Likely we see that the measurement over the uh, um, over Guatemala is uh, has a good quality. So we can see still this very uh, little uh, red area, which is um, pointing to this increase in the SO2 concentrations. So to create a, a study uh, area subset, what I'm going to do is to show you a different approach that I would suppose is the standard. So you would usually uh, import some kind of vector data shapefile or a GeoJSON uh, file that represents the coordinates of the original interest. However, uh, now we're going to take advantage of the IPy leaflet uh, module in Python that allows you to create interactive maps in the uh, Jupyter Notebook. So as you can see, I'm, uh, I have created this map here. I can completely navigate, zoom in, zoom out, um, etc. Uh, by default, I'm centering this map in uh, over Guatemala. And what I'm going to do now is to create a, a study area with uh, this draw a rectangle option. So we can, for example, uh, draw it like this. Um, 
and we have now this rectangle. So the study area is created. What we need is the coordinates of this rectangle, and this we are going to do with this following line in here. You can see how I have accessed the coordinates of the last row uh, in my map. So for example, if I now resize my, my shape uh, and I run this again, the numbers change of course, uh, according to the size of this uh, rectangle. So let's leave it more or less like, like this, I don't know, um, and save it. So if you really zoom in, you will see the location of, of the volcano. So this is the, the city and the volcano is located uh, more or less here. If you zoom in, you, you'll see it. Uh, later on, we'll see it on the map in any ways. Okay, so I have here this uh, rectangle, I have here these coordinates. Now what I need to do is to do the subset and for this, well, um, I am first extracting the lower left and upper right coordinates of this uh, rectangle. I am doing so uh, by basically this is a, a Python list, so I'm, I just want uh, these numbers. And once I have them, I'm going to use again the where function in XArray. This where function can be applied to an XArray variable, in this case, this netcdf file, which is a filter. So I'm going to use uh, the measurement that is already filtered here and I'm going to say okay uh, wherever the longitude or latitude of the product is uh, smaller or larger than the one of my study area taking into account the upper right and lower left coordinates then if those pixels are out of my study area remove it and if they're in uh, keep them Okay, so I'm going to do this for the filter product, but I'm also going to do this for the non-filter product. So uh, the one, uh, the original one, so not this one with these empty areas, but this one here, just that you see the, the difference in the end. Okay, so let's uh, run this. And once it's done, we are on the very last step, which is visualize this subset. Again, I'm using um, Cartopy to do all these plots. I don't want to go too much into details since uh, this is totally up to you, but I'm summarizing here. First of all, we are creating the plot. Then we put some background like the, the land, the ocean, the borders uh, between the countries and the coastline at 10 meters resolution. Then I'm adding some metadata to my plot. So for example, the, um, the text for the title, the text for the location of the city and the text for the location of the volcano, uh, etc. And uh, well, that's, that's, this is just a repetition. So let's have a look to this plot, first of all. Okay, so here we have it. As you can see, the plot um, is automatically scaled to the size of our um, study area with a little bit more of uh, extra um, size. And on the left side, we can see uh, the plot for the non-filtered product, for the non-filtered measurements. Uh, you can see they go from zero um, and then we have also the plot for the filter product. So the one which has this uh, quality flag applied, you can see it here on the title. So we have the, the location of the city and also with this uh, little um, yellow triangle, the uh, location of the actual volcano. Uh, this is in Dobson units and it's for the 3rd of June 2018. So as you can see, quite a big uh, eruption, quite a big uh, concentration, definitely much higher than what we can find in the background. Um, and what I want you to remember is that this plot relies completely on the size of the study area we have uh, set here. So if I change uh, this, it would completely, I mean, the, the plot will adapt automatically, taking into account those, those coordinates, of course. So you can see how the quality flag affected our um, area. You can see uh, many of the background pixels that are around the, the volcano are, they don't exist anymore. Luckily, the measurement around the volcano is uh, kept with good quality. So this is definitely something good. Okay, so this would be uh, more the end of the exercise in a sense that we have learned how to ingest the data, how to um, access the different groups, how to visualize the different variables and uh, pick the, the measurement and do some basic conversions to different units to do a subset in this uh, uh, new way. However, I want to show you a, a different way of plotting this. Uh, most of times when you uh, do this kind of uh, analysis, you want to emphasize to the final user the concentrations uh, that are due to the volcano. So all this yellow is actually not adding any information, but just 
some extra level of misunderstanding that can happen. It's a, a zero, but it would be nice if we could only plot those values um, that are relevant to the eruption of the volcano and set this uh, as, let's say, transparent. However, we cannot, uh, let's say, remove those pixels, for example, here, since they have a good quality, good quality. Some of them disappear because they, they were lower than 0 0.5, but some others, they remain. So what we can do is to assign some transparency for these uh, values that are very close to zero so that they do not show up on the plot and we can only see the, the final, um, we, we can see those pixels that are only relevant to the eruption because they have very high concentration. So how to do this is, uh, it's straightforward in, in Python and the way to do so is to, for example, take a color palette from matplotlib and change the transparency setting. So I'm going to uh, do it here. Again, don't want to go into the details of this specific code. Um, you have it here to play with it. Uh, you can repeat it by yourself and investigate a little bit. But the, the main idea here is that we want to create a custom color bar that has transparency for lower values. And uh, this, in every step that the values increase, the, the, tra the transparency is reduced so that we can see those measurements. So we have created here this uh, custom palette and let's now uh, visualize this new plot. Okay, so here we have it. Um, so as you can see, I have changed the color scheme that I'm uh, using uh, now. Uh, we can see the city of Guatemala, uh, the location of the um, volcano. In this case, I'm using the non-filter uh, product just uh, for the convenience so that you can see the effect of this uh, transparency. And of course, the color palette is something that you can completely change um, according to your preference. Okay, so uh, this would be the end of the exercise. This would, be, this would be, let's say, the final result that you would share with uh, someone that has to assess the impact. Uh, we can see how the concentration of SO2 um, that started in the volcano has uh, been transitioning to the, um, to the um, let's say, to the east of, of the volcano and reaching the city. You can, with this information, assess how this can impact uh, population. You can of course, using the uh, high revisit time of Sentinel 5P, which is daily, you can um, monitor the evolution of this plume, um, especially if it reached the upper atmosphere, or, I mean, the, the stratosphere or the upper troposphere. Uh, and again, it's a tool that helps you not only to detect uh, those emissions, but also to monitor thanks to this great revisit time of uh, Sentinel 5P. So let me now go back to my slides to share with you some uh, take home messages. Okay, um, so first of all, I want to highlight the fact that uh, in Rules Copernicus, we have already other webinars dealing with Sentinel 5P data and other applications. So, for example, we have this one on global air quality. So, in this webinar, you can learn how to derive those global maps for a specific pollutant. Uh, there is a dedicated webinar available on YouTube. You can find it on this link. And of course, the dedicated step by step guide uh, that will guide you through the steps. Also, we uh, did recently uh, another webinar with Sentinel-5P in this case was with uh, NO2. So um, in, in this case, it was for monitoring pollution due to the um, COVID-19. So the, if you remember, there was a huge decrease in, in pollution all over the world. And this uh, was very visible from Sentinel-5P. So in this uh, video, again, uh, you can learn how to do this kind of analysis. And there is a dedicated step-by-step -step guide that you can access to learn those steps. So uh, finally, some take uh, home messages uh, that I want to highlight with you. Um, so you have to remember that with the new Sentinel satellites, uh, the challenge in satellite remote sensing is no longer data availability, but rather how to store and process all the information. In addition to that, it is necessary to explain how the data can be used and support the users in their applications. The Rus Copernicus service is here to solve those problems by providing virtual machines to store and process the data and by offering a dedicated help desk supported by a team of remote sensing experts to help you in your projects with Sentinel data. So before moving to the um, Q&A session, let me tell you again that you can repeat this exercise by your own if you want to practice or if you want to adapt the methodology to your own application. And for that, uh, you need to go to uh, rus-copernicus.eu, Rus register in the Rus, and apply for a virtual machine. During that process, 
we need to specify the uh, training code in this case ADMO03 and uh, you will get the training kit, uh, the same uh, code and everything that I have run in this exercise so that you can repeat it. So with this, I'm going to finish here the session. I hope you have uh, learned something new today, that uh, you have discovered new ways of exploiting Sentinel-5P data in the context of uh, volcano eruptions. We will now move the, the Q&A, uh, we will now move, sorry, to the Q&A session in case you have some doubts uh, that we can discuss together. But in any case, I will close here the session. Thank you very much for joining and I uh, hope to, to see you in the next one. Bye. Okay, so let's uh, start the Q&A session. Uh, during the uh, last hour, I've been receiving some ones that I think can be relevant for all of you. So, um, of course, take advantage and if you have uh, more questions, uh, send them now. I will review uh, the ones I have received so far that I think are relevant. Well, uh, the first one um, I got was a non-related Sentinel 5P question, but I, I want to address it since this is something that can be useful for you. As you know, Copernicus is not only delivering uh, space data, there are different components, but in addition to that, there's also a, a DEM has been made available. And uh, just for you to know, uh, there, there are DEMs from Copernicus available and you can uh, find them uh, very easily. If you just Google DEM Copernicus, you, you will find the information there. Um, another question I uh, got here is if it's possible to download um, Sentinel-5P data, uh, for um, instead of downloading the full orbit as we have done, if it's possible to do it for a smaller area. So um, the, the answer for this is it depends. If you are looking for near real-time products, yes, you will be downloading um, um, a product which extent is not the full orbit, um, so it's uh, definitely smaller. But uh, those products are then converted into offline products, and uh, then the full orbit is delivered to users. Uh, in any case, uh, I guess if you are coming from Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2, you might expect, if you think about the full orbit of S1 or S2 data, this is very heavy. But in the case of Sentinel-5P, it's not that much. Um, so, well, the, the, it's not, I mean, depends on, on the volume of data you are processing, but it's not uh, at the scale of other Sentinel missions. And as you can see, it's also very easy to process NetCDF files and, uh, and uh, do a subset to a study area. Today, we did it with this interactive way, uh, with this map. But of course, uh, if you have coordinates, if you have a shapefile, a GeoJSON file, or something like that, you can very quickly automatize this uh, subset process. Okay, um, another question here was about Jupyter Notebook. If, um, so someone was asking if it's possible to download uh, Jupyter Notebook locally, or if it's only available on the virtual machine. So for those of you that are, that are starting your, your the, you're doing the first steps into Python and, and Jupyter maybe, let me clarify this. Jupyter Notebook is just um, a, um, an integrated development environment. So it's just a place and a, a web application in this case, where you can write your Python code. So definitely you can download it locally into your uh, machine. There's no limitation on that. And uh, using Jupyter Notebook, you can write Python code, uh, but it's also compatible with other programming languages. This is also for you to know in case you are interested in working with uh, R, for example, or even uh, there are kernels for many, many uh, languages right now available. So yes, you can download it uh, locally. The only difference is gonna be that you will not be running your analysis within the cloud resources of Rus Copernicus because you are not within the virtual machine. Uh, so, of course, you have to, to take this into account. Um, someone was asking about the training code for this exercise. Uh, well, you see it on the slide here, Atmo03. So if you want to repeat this exercise, first of all, go to the website, as I just said, uh, register, and uh, then apply for a VM, and you can use this code to request the training kit. You will be provided with uh, all the data that is needed, uh, also a PDF guide that will, uh, that will guide you through the process, of course, and also be aware that as part of the exercise, you are requested to download the Sentinel-5P products by yourself. So we don't provide them by default. You have to go through the download process. I think it's a good uh, step for those of you that are new so that you get used to 
this uh, data access uh, step. Um, okay, next question here. Uh, can we can can someone receive a training kit if they are from uh, a non-European Union country? Well, the the thing with Fus Copernicus is that we are focusing on uh, European uh, residents or nationals, or at least Copernicus contributing countries. So unfortunately, to get a virtual machine, you have to be a resident in a in an EU country. Um, in any case, the training sessions we do in Rus Copernicus, like the webinar especially, they are open to everybody and you are, uh, of course, welcome to join as, as much as you want. Um, but for cloud resources and for remote face-to-face -face events or, or face-to-face -face events, we, um, we stick to, to European residents. Um, okay, let's go to the next question. So someone is asking that uh, even when uh, using the QA filter uh, that we have seen in this webinar, so this QA value, sometimes I have negative numbers for SO2. I, how can I justify uh, that or, or what, what's happening in there? Uh, why do we have negative values? Well, that's a very uh, good question. So uh, I, I, uh, I suppose you have already been playing with this type of data, but I think you are missing I would suppose that you are missing the read of the technical guide I was showing previously on my slides. Uh, the technical, the negative numbers is something, uh, it's not a, and definitely there is a, a meaning for that, but I do recommend you to check the technical documentation of the products because uh, everything is explained in there, uh, all the cases in which a negative value can happen. Um, and I think this is gonna help you a lot to really master the, the data um, and all the, different uh, patterns that you can find, not only for the SO2 products, but definitely for all the level two uh, Sentinel 5 p products. I imagine if you are working with SO2, at some point you're going to be working with other uh, gases, and uh, there are other effects, other artifacts on the data um, that you have to take into account. For example, the fact of selecting a specific QA threshold, uh, this is also something, of course, you can choose it by yourself, but there is uh, literature on, on which one to choose um, based on, on the technical details on, on these guides. So I do recommend you to, to check it um, if you, uh, well, I'm leaving here the link, but um, you can just Google this in the uh, in the um, official ESA website for Sentinel 5P, you will find it very easily. Okay, so let me see if I'm missing any other question. I think I'm not. Go to the last slide here. Okay. Okay, well, I see no more questions so far. I'm just going to wait one or two more minutes in case someone is uh, having a last minute doubt. Um, okay, there we go. Another question. Do we have a training uh, on how to mosaic multiple data sets? Uh, yes. Uh, so as I said during the webinar, we in Rusko Pernigus have done already all the trainings for Sentinel 5P data. Um, to create mosaics with multiple data sets, uh, for example, in this one, uh, this training here, we derived among all the products global maps of uh, NO2 in this case. Um, in, in that exercise, we were not using uh, Python by itself, but we were using these uh, atmospheric toolbox, more in concrete, the HARP uh, toolbox. Uh, so in this, uh, in this webinar, which uh, is also available on YouTube right now, you can see how this is done. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, having a look to the temporal evolution of, um, of uh, gas, then we have this other webinar. Uh, which again is also available in YouTube now. And here we were looking at the temporal dimension of uh, the concentration over time. In this exercise, uh, we were having a look to the case of NO2 due to the uh, COVID lockdown at the beginning of 2020. Um, and again, it's another example of how you can merge uh, multiple data set and, and derive some insights from, from that. 
Uh, okay, I have another question here. Is it possible to get a PDF file with the code and instructions? Well, I have to say that the uh, the full training kit is only available for those that can have access to a Roots virtual machine. Unfortunately, this is the uh, the, the rule of the project that, that is set by ESA. So all the training kit is available for those that can get um, access to the to the VM. Uh, in any case, uh, if you're interested in the code, I mean, with the example uh, you have seen today in the in the webinar and uh, with um, with uh, some uh, research, I, I'm very sure you can find our information. The key thing here is you remember we have used the Python X array library, and you can find plenty, plenty of information about that. It's very well documented uh, on how to um, process NetCDF files. Uh, we have a question here: if um, the average uh, concentration over time can be created the same way with NO2. Okay, let me maybe be a little bit more concrete here. In this exercise, uh, which is available on YouTube, what we did was to take um, over a study area, which was in the north of Italy, all the products uh, from, I'm not wrong, from uh, beginning of January till uh, beginning of March, if I'm not wrong. Um, so we took all the available products for an area and then we merged them together so that we could create uh, these maps here that you can see uh, that are showing what was the uh, average concentration over that time for that study area. And once we had that map, we compared to a previous year. And in the, in the context of the COVID lockdown, we could see very clearly the difference between uh, the pre-pandemic and uh, post-pandemic situation. Um, so it's not exactly the same way we have them here. Definitely there is X-Array, uh, the, the module is also involved, uh, but there are some slightly different uh, steps. In any case, you, you can watch the video and uh, it's going to be clear there. Okay, so let's give a couple of minutes more in case someone has another popping question. Uh, okay. So I see no more questions coming. Uh, hope everything is clear. Definitely, if you have more doubts, you can contact us. Um, all the information, uh, it's uh, here on the slide. So again, I hope you have learned something new today. Uh, I, hope, I hope it's more clear for you how to process Sentinel 5P data. Maybe it's a satellite that if you're coming from uh, Sentinel 2 or Sentinel 1, it's uh, an application that is not very common for you. And maybe you, you had a lot of uh, doubts on how to approach this new this Sentinel uh, mission. But well, well, now you have a, a clear path into into your projects with S five P data. And I uh, hope to see you soon in another Ruscop in this webinar. And I wish you a good afternoon or morning, whatever you <laughs> whatever you are. Okay, ciao.